Okay, welcome. Thank you all for coming. And, and just like the earlier sections, we'll keep it informal. We uh, in, invite questions and uh, I'm gonna cover a variety of topics and then Andre is gonna kind of conclude um, with CO2. You can see quite a few of those highlighted under the different buckets we referred to, the, the four E's we have here, um, low condensing, electronic controls, natural refrigerants, where Andre's gonna focus on CO2 and then some of the economics going on within food retailer or supermarket. So starting with the, the efficiency, um, I, the key takeaway here is really just to look at where you're operating your condensing of your systems. If, if you're operating anywhere above um, 90 degrees Fahrenheit or even 70, um, nowadays we see the high-end retailers really pushing the limits down to a 50 degrees minimum condensing. Um, so you can see that this chart has a lot of information, a you know, typical temperature profile. This is Boston. The majority of your time is, is spent below 60 degrees and there's a real opportunity for savings. You can see what that does to the, in this case, the compressor, which is using a majority of the energy. Um, your power is going down as you lower your condensing and your capacity is actually going up. Um, so there's a significant increase in efficiency. And a lot of people we talk about, you know, in the South, is this really valuable to us? You can see even down in Atlanta, you're spending 50% of your time below 60 degrees. And then quantifying some of those savings. So, so we've known this information for a while, so why aren't people doing low condensing? Um, there was some challenges in the past with the you know, balance point TXVs, be able to handle that liquid quality at, at lower condensing. With the technology today with you know, electronic expansion valves that have linear capacity with, with digital modulation 10 to 100% on the compressor, and, and with the, the head fan cycling, we've had a ton of success stories um, going in, retrofitting stuff, also on the, the new construction where return on investment is, is less than 12 months. So, Really kind of look at where your system's operating. If there's opportunities, definitely um, engage the, the people here to kind of talk through how we've accomplished this, not only in supermarkets, but data centers, process chillers, um, cold warehouse type applications. Focusing in on the, the equipment a little bit, specifically here on, um, just wanted to touch on our compressor electronics, we refer to CoreSense. So what you see pictured here is kind of our latest release of CoreSense. Um, if you're not that familiar, or how many people are familiar with CoreSense? Okay, so essentially the concept is kind of using the compressor as a sensor as an indicator of the overall system health. So we're using uh, a variety of inputs, um, including discharge temperature, compressor amps, um, compressor voltage in, in some cases, um, and basically looking at signals, algorithms over time to uh, give you that predictive kind of maintenance and information. You, the various uh, types on, on this, the various types and inputs on here, you got uh, discharge temperature protection. We're also doing liquid injection versus uh, with electronic expansion valve versus a kind of old mechanical valve. Um, and we're doing digital control. So in the past, this would require kind of a separate module, but it's a nice integrated solution um, within this uh, terminal box here. And then, w which we've had a little bit of success in supermarket implementing is, is actually communicating down to the component level, the compressor level, feeding up through, well, this is the Emerson system, but it would be available uh, to third party controllers as well and then available on your PC. So you can really dig into down to the compressor level um, what information you're seeing from amps, discharge temperature, et cetera, which allows very valuable troubleshooting. Um, we've seen this time and time in our kind of field tests where we're doing some controlled experiments. Just to, to look at the economics a little bit, I mean, I don't think it's, uh, it's any secret that it's somewhat saturated for food retail for the supermarkets. So, you know, what they're looking at uh, really going after the convenience and the fresh, you know, the younger generation, you kind of want, want things now, um, and then also the fresh. So I think this gives our industry a lot of opportunity. We're, we're more and more relevant to these retailers, you know, kind of as refrigeration increases and as food quality becomes more and more important. And then the big question mark, which was, was referenced this morning down here in the lower right, is the information technology, whether it's security or big data, um, Internet of Things, or even kind of online grocery with, we see Amazon Fresh and, and a variety of names um, getting into that space that's somewhat stealing investment from, from new stores, larger stores. So we'll see how that plays out or, or even the maintenance. So 
more and more conversations that, you know, how do we as an industry play into that Internet of Things discussion just like um, they referred to this morning. Then switching gears to um, the last E with the, with the environment, how, how we've looked at this for five to ten years and when we talk to the regulators is what we refer to as LCCP, life cycle climate performance. Um, so that includes both the, the direct and indirect emissions, which was referred to a little bit this morning as well. Um, so you can see here on the chart various systems from a, a centralized 404A DX system. You know, Rajan referred to the A1 lower GWP blends at, at 1500, so you're essentially cutting um, the emissions effect due to the direct in half. Uh, if I guess if I just set this chart, you have the green and the blue. This is associated with the low temp or the freezer. Um, CO2 emissions per year due to the energy. Um, same with the, the blue due to the medium temp energy. You got purple, a low temp, essentially your leaks, and then this tan orange color here associated with your medium temp leak. So like I said, you're, you're cutting that impact, you're 40% you're just by going to a lower GWP refrigerant blend. And then as you move to smaller charge systems, you, you cascade system with CO2 on the low temp, a, a secondary fluid where you're no longer sending that refrigerant out to the, the store floor and then a booster system, essentially eliminate all that direct stuff. But I think the main message that we wanted to try to make on this was as you lower that GWP, it's kind of diminishing returns. You really need to look at, at energy and how you're producing your energy. Um, so, you know, the story in Canada is different than it is in Europe than, than it is in the U.S. Uh, on how you're producing the energy and, and what's the best way to... Um, kind of reduce the, the CO2 emissions. It may not be just a direct GWP um, kind of reduction like they're doing in SNAP today. So I think we'll have some interesting conversations with, with the regulators going forward, but they've kind of already set a precedent. I mean, GWP is very easy to regulate. How do you regulate energy system architecture type of stuff? So one thing I do want to point out on this analysis, so we took some of the, the larger assumptions that go behind this analysis and just plotted the impact. So you can see the kind of the energy savings impact percent wise and you know with the minimum condensing 15 20 percent whether you're superheat six percent a lot of times we're out and we see all these comparisons and you know that that may be great if you're comparing it to a, a 10 or a 15 year old system but if you want to compare you know future future system you really need to dig into kind of what's the assumptions and and what's the baseline that they're comparing that system to so i i point out a few here there, there's a lot of other variables, but, but definitely ask questions when you start to see um, results from case studies. And, and Rajan touched on the Montreal Protocol and what's going on there. I, I put this chart in here because sometimes it's, it's hard for people with, with all the different discussion, you know, how do all these different organizations kind of fit together. Um, you know, he touched on SNAP. CARB is also considering um, some emission reduction legislation. There was a presentation last summer and they were talking about, you know, some of these different methods down here, HFC bans and taxes uh, or following a phase down like they have in the FGAS, but I haven't seen an actual proposal, so stay tuned on that one. And the reason I put these on the, the you know, the global aspect, even though it doesn't directly impact us in the U.S., a lot of these guys are, are setting a standard or a baseline that the U.S. is looking at. Even a lot of the, the retailers are following that to understand how they can start planning for that 10 year, 15 year horizon. And then on the right, a lot of the volunteer organizations, and, and I reference Sheko here as well, which has done a great job of kind of bringing up the knowledge of, of what's capable. You know, often in our industry, it seems like there's pockets of expertise, but Sheko's done a good job, and Michael's actually with the, with the Accelerate magazine, which I don't have referenced here, but there's a copy out there that does a lot of you know, kind of those leading edge trials, which I'm going to talk to on the next slide, and get bringing visibility that it is possible. Um, consumer Goods Forum, that's an interesting one. It's the Coke, Pepsi's, McDonald's, but also a lot of the retailers, I mean, Walmart, Kroger, that signed up to start phasing out of HFCs by 2015. Um, so what the impact that we've seen is, is one kind of natural store that, and, and this happens at the executive level. The CEOs are, are committing to these things, and it's not always fully understood what the impact on the organization is going to be. So as an industry, I do think we need to kind of raise our level of conversation to, 
to become where we can you know, talk to the executives, why invest in HVAC and our kind of design and maintenance versus the retailing marketing side of the business. So. And then my last slide, just touching on some of those kind of leading edge trials. Um, you can see HEB, Sprouts, Albertsons um, were in the news quite a bit as far as their ammonia, CO2, and propane store they've done. And then Walgreens actually had a whole Facebook page dedicated to their store in Evanston, Illinois, where they're trying to get a net zero store. Essentially, the energy used equals the, the energy produced um, at that location. So they've done a, a lot to, to kind of promote that. I would, I mean, the one thing, I mean, there's not a return on investment in that store. They're very upfront that, that they're kind of learning, experimenting that, that the economics are not there to kind of accomplish that on a, on a large volume. And then I just give a sneak preview of, of what CO2 that, that Andre is going to kind of go into more detail, what it looks like in Europe with just over 1,300 systems. I, I know a lot of times I, I talk to people that are like, you know, why do I need to kind of worry about CO2 when it's not necessarily in my area? Um, but the conversations that I have on, on natural refrigerants, it's like, it's almost to the point where it's 75, 80% of the conversation is kind of on the natural refrigerants, even though the installed base is still, a, you know, 1% of the market. And then from from an Atmosphere America, which is a kind of natural refrigerants conference, Hill Phoenix showed some of these numbers here, where you can see the corresponding 1300 number in Europe is only uh, about 50 in the US. Um, these blue bars here are actually secondary type systems, um, which Andre is going to go into a little bit more detail. My objective basically today is to talk about CO2 being used in the supermarket really for commercial refrigeration. Kind of give you a snapshot for different system architectures, secondary, cascade, and transcritical booster systems. That's really the objective today. Uh, there is a lot of activity going on. And, you know, some of the general uses of, of CO2 in the past, even, you know, if you do the groceries like I do, then, you know, you'll see a lot of modified atmospheric packaging. Your meats are all packaged within this gas inside to keep it nice and, and, and fresh looking all the time. Uses we don't even know about. And then refrigeration. And refrigeration, of course, because CO2 is a global warming potential of one um, compared to 4,000 roughly for 404A, uh, it's getting a lot of uh, positive press because of it. Um, you know, when you get right back down to it, uh, in refrigeration we tend to focus on what's called Coleman grade, which is a 99.99% pure CO2. And really, when you talk about the different grades, as you get pure and pure, you get less and less moisture content is really what it is. It's got your, the refrigeration grades got less than 10% parts per million of moisture in it. And also the bottles that you get it in have been evacuated and cleaned and all that kind of stuff that you would expect when you charge it into a system. Um, so different grades really as you get, like I said, um, they're drier and drier as you go down the line. Ozone depletion of CO2 zero, global warming potential, I already mentioned is one, non-toxic, uh, non-toxic in reasonable amounts. If you get in a room and you get a leak, I mean, it can uh, asphyxiate you, so you gotta keep that in mind, like any refrigerant. You know, it's inexpensive, it's about a dollar a pound relative to HFCs, so from a cost refrigerant point of view, um, has better heat transfer properties than HFCs. Um, reduction, as I mentioned, in gas. CO2 lines are typically smaller, especially the suction lines are typically smaller. We're operating at much higher pressures than you would in an HFC. The amount of pressure drop uh, is lower. Uh, material compatibility is good. And the performance is very good. Um, cool climates especially, uh, but there's a lot of work that's basically taking that northern equator of operation and driving it lower and lower further south with all new technologies that are happening around the world. You take about uh, CO2 as some, there's kind of a, a couple of critical things about CO2. Uh, one is it's triple point, something we never really talked about before, and the other is critical point of the refrigerant, and that really only happens there's about 159 degree Fahrenheit difference between the triple point where it turns to dry ice, and the critical point where it's at the top of the pressure enthalpy diagram. Um, 
And really, when you're operating above the critical point, your, your pressures and temperatures no longer, they're no longer equate to each other. They're independent of each other. Uh, when you're down in the, in the triple point down here, you've got liquid vapor and gas existing at the same point. Below there, you're only at 60.6 pounds, which is above atmosphere, right? So that's really important to note, because if someone's doing service and they think they, they need to change your dryer course, for example, and they think that they've pulled the pressure down, they've gotten all the liquid out of the system, and for some reason, some didn't, they, all the liquid didn't leave the system, and then all of a sudden they start cracking these bolts off, and you expose that dryer shell to atmosphere, well, atmosphere is much lower than 60 pounds, so all of a sudden all that liquid turns to dry ice. Boom. Now you've got an ice cream cone inside your SDAS, inside your dryer shell. And all that ice is sitting at minus 109.3 degrees Fahrenheit. So you don't want to touch it, it'll immediately burn yourself. So you've got to get rid of that dry ice and also all the moisture that started to condensing inside the shell because being refrigeration people, we know that moisture is not good inside a system, especially free water. So if that happens, of course, you've got to make sure you dry that shell out before you close it up and evacuate and do all the things that we normally do with any refrigeration system. Um, as I mentioned, 109, minus 109.3 is at atmospheric temperature would be the temperature of dry ice. You compare different uh, temperatures at atmosphere, 404A and other refrigerants. The critical temperature, 87.8 degrees or 31 Celsius, that's certainly attainable on, a, on the condensing side of any refrigeration system. But you wouldn't see it really in any of these other gases. It's way up there. We never work in the critical, beyond the critical point. In, in HFC refrigerants, but that's important to understand for critic for CO2. And that temperature is equivalent to this pressure over a thousand pounds at 87.8 degrees. So we're talking about different pressures, much higher pressures to deal with. Triple point, like I mentioned, is above atmospheric pressure quite a bit. And at 20 degrees, if you've got a cylinder sitting there or your system is, is off for a long period of time and your, your temperature is raised to 20 degrees Celsius or 68 Fahrenheit, the saturation pressure is 815 pounds. So it's a different animal to deal with. But it's still refrigeration. And the basics of refrigeration that you apply for 134A and HFCs are still the same basics of refrigeration and service that you do here. You just have to be aware of what happens when your condensing goes above 87.8 and how low you've got to the triple point. So, so you change your charging practices. You change, you, you look at trying to keep your head pressures as low as possible for as long as possible for efficiency's sake. So, when we talk about CO2, it's funny because I've been doing trainings for a very long time and, and, and in doing the trainings, typically we show pressure enthalpy diagrams where you're doing basic to refrigeration. But when CO2 started, it's almost up there all the time because it's one good way of talking about that critical point. You know, we all know your saturated liquid line comes up to here and your saturated vapor lines in the back end, but that very tip is that critical point. And we never really talked about it much for HFCs, like I mentioned, but now that we're into CO2, that's pretty low. That's 87.8 degrees or 31 Celsius. Typically, we always run below that critical point, so in subcritical mode, your condensing occurs below critical, just like any HFC system. And this would be basically a plus 20 degree condensing on a low temp CO2. But it is possible, as ambient warms up, that you're operating above that critical point. And you can, you can remove as much heat as you want out of that, that refrigerant vapor, but your pressure is not gonna be affected. And so that's really your transcritical cycle. You'll operate in there part of the time, and you can also operate below that transcritical point. So it's kind of the refrigerant in itself. I'm going to 
touch on secondary systems. And a secondary system is basically uh, a chiller type scenario. Typically you've got a high stage system. Um, it could be, could be ammonia, could be an HFC, could be an HFO for that matter, on the high stage and you've got a heat exchanger in the middle and you're just basically circulating CO2 through the system, condensing your CO2 down to a usable temperature because you're pumping the CO2 out to your cases. So if you're operating around minus 20, you've got approximately minus 20 CO2 liquid coming off that heat exchanger, dropping into a receiver, being pumped by a pump out to your cases, which are controlled by solenoid valves. It's a volatile fluid CO2. So unlike a, a glycol, where you're only, basically your heat removal is happening sensibly, you don't get a change of state in your glycol, but with a CO2, it actually starts to boil. So you've got latent heat removal and sensible heat removal. So you've got, you may have a 50-50 mix coming back to this receiver slash, uh, well, receiver back here, your vapor, CO2 vapor gets pulled off and gets recondensed. So your temperatures are, are fairly close to the same throughout that cycle. Of course, they'll change as it removes heat, but they're fairly close to the same relative to other systems that we understand. On a cascade system, um, basically, we're familiar with the top part. The top part is an HFC system, and it could be a standalone system for all that matters. But when you include CO2, you'll have an HFC at the top here, could be 134A, uh, where you, in a retail cascade system, you may use that 134A to actually refrigerate your medium temp cases, but you're also using that gas to refrigerate a condenser. So that electronic expansion valve is controlling the superheat off of a CO2 condenser, which is keeping those CO2 pressures in the subcritical zone. You might be at a 30 degree condensing here. So you got 30 degree liquid coming and feeding your low temperature expansion devices and coming back to your low temperature compressors. So when Mitch showed the chart on LCCP where the energy use on those CO2 low temp compressors were low, it was low because, geez, we're running a 30 degree condensing. Your compression ratios are, are very low, so the energy is low. That medium temp, yeah, you're gonna use more energy, but on low temps it was low because the compression ratios are quite low. Um, the discharge pressures on a cascade systems are typically what you'd find in a 410A system. So we're, we understand 410A systems, you're in the 400, 450 pound range, and all those liquid line components that go into this particular low temp cascade all have those approvals up to 680 pounds anyway, though the standard components are still approved pressure-wise for the low temp side. Of course, you're gonna have pressure relief valves also in those systems. But it's basically, you're, this is really what we're talking about, cascade. It could be a larger platform or smaller platform. And pressures on the low side of the cascade, if you're running around minus 20, minus, so you're looking at uh, 200 pounds to 250 pounds in the low temp, it could be a little bit lower. On the high side of your CO2, depending on what your condensing is, if you're condensing at 28 degrees Fahrenheit, then you're at 450 pounds. Well, that's why I talked about you know, relative pressures on the high side to 410A. Our booster transcritical system, it's made up a little bit different. One thing that is unique about a booster transcritical system is that you're sharing the refrigerant. It's the same refrigerant that's circulating on the high side, the medium temp, and the low temp. Unlike the cascade, you had two separate refrigerant, two separate circuits. Unlike traditional DX systems today, you've got a medium temp rack, you've got a low temp rack. Well, this one's all, built on the same frame. So you've got number one, you've got your transcritical compressors going off and discharging into a gas cooler or condenser, depending how, how hot it is. We'll talk a little bit more about that. 
The gas comes out, or liquid, depending how cold it is, goes through a pressure reducing valve we'll talk about that feeds into a, a receiver or flash tank. That CO2 liquid leaves the bottom of that flash tank and feeds all your medium temp cases, but it's the same receiver that's also feeding all your low temp cases. Low temp compressors discharge into the suction. Well, their discharge line is also tapped into the suction line of your medium temp cases, and there's a bypass valve here as well. So another thing that's unique about these transcritical booster supermarket systems is that the medium temperature compressors have three sources of suction gas. And I'll walk through that in a second to find out uh, what the purpose of each are. So compressors, typically, um, many compressors are rated up to 135 bar pressure relief valve. They can operate up to 120 bar. 120 bar is 1,740 pounds. That's pretty high. <clears throat> Uh, many are, are VFD rated, and on the low side, the suction side, these compressors, uh, depending on the manufacturer, can be 90 bar or even 100 bar low side pressures. So, it's really, and this is really what they're looking at. We're looking discharge from a medium temp, as I mentioned, the discharge of my low temp compressors is really my, the same suction pressure that my medium temp undergoes. They all feed into the same point. So it goes off into the gas cooler. And one of the things that's happened with gas coolers is that, as I mentioned, in order to drop the, the transcritical booster line or equator, if you will, to try to get it to go further and further south, and the reason I'm saying that is we want to try to keep this, this pressure, this red line down below the critical point as much as possible because that's where it's most efficient. So uh, manufacturers are starting to add these, they call them adiabatic pads or specialized condensers that have these pads on the, outlet, on the outside that trickle water down along these pads and as, as the air draws, gets drawn across, you get this wet uh, air, moist air going across that condenser and allows it to work with lower condensing temperatures, keeping it in a subcritical zone as, as long as possible, which allows you to run your systems uh, in warmer ambience. The other thing that happens here, when the gas or the liquid leaves this uh, gas cooler condenser, it gets to a very critical part of, of, of a booster system, which is a high pressure control and a high pressure valve. And the function of these two in combination, well, these controllers, this valve and the bypass valve, is that when you're operating in subcritical mode, that controller will control the subcooling amount. But when it's in transcritical mode, above, then it optimizes the COP of the system. Um, so that's important to try to optimize the, the, the efficiency. But what it's doing is that pressure gets into three, which is up here, a high pressure three, goes through this pressure reducing valve, and as the pressure reduces, now you have liquid that starts to fall out. And that liquid falls in the bottom of your receiver. So it goes to the left, and now you've got, you're at the saturated liquid line, and, and there's a little bit of subcooling there as well. So you actually have at point five liquid coming off of that, feeding your cases. The other function of that control is also, how do you maintain that pressure in that flash tank all the time? Because your, your ambient conditions are changing, your pressures are going up and down. So in order to try to maintain a flash tank pressure, you've got a valve there that's releasing, opening and closing to try to maintain that receiver pressure at this point. You don't want that receiver pressure going up and down because your liquid line pressures will go up and down, and then your expansion valves will be affected, and your superheat will be affected, and your suction pressure will be affected. So you want to try to maintain as tight uh, flash tank pressures as possible, and that valve helps to do that for efficiency's sake. So the next point is, for warmer climates, 
you're going to be running high pressures all the time. And in warm climates, I mean, when you're bypassing through this valve, you could bypass up to 30% of the system load, which is a huge number in order to maintain those pressures. And what the industry has done is say, well, you know what, instead of bypassing through the valve alone and having a lower suction pressure, we're going to tap off of that receiver and we're going to bring higher pressure into one compressor. So we're going to parallel those compressors, but have it see flash tank pressures at its inlet, which means your compression ratios just drop, which makes it more efficient when you need it in high ambient. So parallel compression is really what we're talking about. And you can see here that instead of running my compressor from this lower suction right up to this discharge, that one compressor on the left is starting from this point at a higher suction, lower compression ratio, you, can use, you have higher capacity, you can downside the, the size of the compressor to optimize efficiency. And you can see up to 8% energy improvement when that's uh, operating. So that's one of the things that's being done in the industry for higher ambient areas. The other one, as I mentioned, is adiabatic condensing and another technology called ejectors that's being uh, uh, tested a lot in Europe. Um, one thing that's also unique and one thing that Mitch talked about is when you're comparing transcritical booster system CO2 to HFC, it's important to compare apples to apples. If you're floating a CO2 system to 50 condensing and you're not comparing against an HFC system that's floating, you're not apples to apples. If you're comparing a booster system that every single evaporator has got an electronic expansion valve, which they do on CO2, and you, you compare it to a mechanical expansion valve system, then you're not comparing apples to apples. That's why it's difficult when someone compares one system to the other to make sure the comparables are exactly the same. HFCs will have electronic valves on all of these. And a lot of these con case controllers from manufacturers uh, are capable of operating as standalone devices. I mean, they can do temperature, <clears throat> defrost, valve control, superheat control, lights, anti sweats, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's one thing that you'll see on a lot of HFC systems, uh, excuse me, booster CO2 systems. And the other thing, of course, is the specialty uh, subcritical compressors. Um, Emerson, we've got the scrolls, and we also have a semi-hermetic version. Basically, we've taken these compressors and re-rated them for low temp use, skinny down the motor, so we can have high standstill pressures. Uh, these current scrolls, high side, are 630 bar, is their standstill pressure uh, limit, and on the low side is 28 bar, 406 pounds. So, and, and we, we provide a pressure relief uh, valve with that. And the PoE, the oils that are used in the, the, uh, the Emerson compressors, the PoE uh, 68 oil, um, we're also currently rating them for PAG oil, PAG oil uh, in Europe, and those, those results should be out uh, shortly as well. So we should have a dual rating shortly on the transcritical compressors. And from a controller point of view, um, in North America, we, we, well, really all over the world, a lot of, there's a lot of distributed architecture, as I mean, mentioned, a lot of components can actually operate on their own. Uh, with the E2, you're capable of, of pulling all that information via Modbus into the controller, whether it's a drive, whether it's the core sense like Mitch talked about, whether it's your, your uh, leak detection or, or the case controls, oil management. So um, you can pull all that into there and, uh, and control it as well. So really, I, I, talk, I talked about the different system architectures. Um, transcritical systems in North America, mostly in Canada, they started about eight, seven years ago, I guess it was. And currently, by the end of this year, there'll be somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 transcritical booster stores operating in Canada. Uh, 72 are by one end user, um, which is uh, Sobeys, and they were in the, the current uh, Accelerate magazine. There's a whole layout on there that talks about all their stores, where they are, and so on and so forth. 
Um, but it works well for Canada because we operate most of the time in a subcritical mode. Not very often do we operate above 87.8 condensing. You know, 90% of the year we're at 60 ambient or below. You know, we're talking about the night times and everything, but, but that's what we're talking about. Um, but as I mentioned more and more uh, with new technology, trying to, to allow these systems to operate further and further south. There's one in Georgia, a store that's operated uh, in Georgia, a sprout store that's been uh, operated almost, almost the whole summer in subcritical. Uh, so that's encouraging news because of the technology that was used there. Cascade systems continue to be used in uh, warmer ambience. There's probably uh, 80, when we were in Brazil not long ago, they, they estimate there's about 80 Cascade stores in Brazil. But even in Brazil, they're, they're thinking about trying booster transcritical systems in southern Brazil where it's cooler. Well, you take a look at the average temperatures there, and is it a, is it a spot to operate? So they're happening there, and of course here in the U.S., um, there's uh, several trials happening, so end users can understand for themselves, you know, what is this really doing on an energy point of view? What is it really doing on a, a GWP reduction point of view? What is it doing on my maintenance costs, and how does that total cost of ownership compare to an HFC system? So. A lot of trials happening right now in the U.S. Uh, there is a, a document, if you're interested in that, it's a, a um, commercial CO2 document. It's, it's a basic document that goes through really from start to finish on CO2, system architectures, and differences between HFC and CO2. It's, it, it's a nice document um, to have. And this is basically a summary slide that just talks about um, there's a lot of stuff on here, and if I really explained it in detail, I, you know, Don would be giving me the zero, zero minute sign, but um, it compares really different system architecture and booster transcritical being here, uh, cascade systems based on energy. Um, now this is energy in cold in cool climates is very good. On average, we have to look at that environment equipment differences and costs and ec economics so uh, it's kind of a, a summary slide you'll be able to have a look at